Welcome back. In last lecture, we had a look, very brief look at oil refining, and we saw that refineries were big and complex plant. We also had a look at one of our first integrated chemical sites, an integrated chemical site that stemmed from the use of synthesis gas, a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, either derived from coal, when I started my career, or from methane, when I ended my career. We saw how synthesis gas could lead to a diverse range of products, such as fertilisers, ammonium nitrate, which is also, of course, an explosive, and ammonium sulphate, another fertiliser. We saw how it produced the intermediate chemicals required to make a polymer, perspex, polymethyl methacrylate. We also saw that during this processing, it was sometimes necessary to use very hazardous intermediate chemicals. For example, hydrogen cyanide, we combined the hydrogen cyanide with acetone to make acetone cyanohydrin, which in turn made methyl methacrylate, which in turn made polymethyl methacrylate. What I would like to do in this part of this lecture is to look at another chemical route, that of benzene, toluene and xylene. And we will see again that an entire branch of the chemical industry depends on these aromatic products. So I'm going to stay in my old place of work around Billingham and introduce you to one of the sites that we were connected to via pipeline, which was a new site, well, it was new in my career, it was built in the 1950s, that was devoted to polymer processing, ethylene production, and paraxylene and pyrolysis gasoline production. Now, we'll see that this polymer processing site was entirely derived from benzenes, toluenes, and xylenes. We're going to start with naphtha, as our feedstock. This is an intermediate chemical separated out by oil refining. We're going to undertake a process called steam cracking with this naphtha, which is predominantly there to make something called ethylene. You'll know this as ethene. Ethylene is a very important intermediate chemical in the chemical industry. In fact, we're going to be talking in the next part of this lecture all about ethylene. A byproduct of the steam cracking process, however, is something called pyrolysis gasoline. People liked to abbreviate it to pie gas. I prefer pyrolysis gasoline. Pyrolysis gasoline is up to 50 weight percent of benzene, of toluene and xylene. Sometimes this is abbreviated to BTX. It also contains olefins. You'll know olefins as alkenes. 25 weight percent of pyrolysis gasoline was olefins. Other aromatics were also present, some polycyclic aromatics as well as paraffins and naphthenes, sorry, I, I should say alkanes and cycloalkanes, paraffins and naphthenes, up to 10 weight percent of these. So we can see that pyrolysis gasoline is chocked full of very, very valuable chemicals which give rise to lots of different parts of the chemical industry. In terms of location, here we are up in the northeast of England again. And let's zoom in to the site. So the map you see now is slightly different to the map I put on of Billingham. We're a little bit further east, a few miles further east. South of the River Tees, as well as some steelworks, we have the Wilton chemical site. North of the River Tees, we have the North Tees site, sometimes also known as Seal Sands. Now, this new site of Wilton was opened in 1951 during the white heat of technology. It was the third site to be added in this area. This site was connected by pipeline to the North Tees site, both of which were connected via pipeline to the seals to the Billingham site, which made the Middlesbrough area one of the world's largest integrated chemicals production areas. It was truly amazing. The reason why Wilton was built here was because there was a lot of existing chemical industry here. It could be readily integrated within the existing industry, as well as a lot of expertise. Also, the River Tees provides a deep water port, the Port of Tees port. And initially you can bring in products such as pyrolysis gasoline if you need it, or naphtha if you need to import. But later on, during the 1960s and the 1970s, when North Sea oil was found, North Sea oil was piped ashore in North Tees. Consequently, three refineries were built in North Tees, which fed directly into this vast petrochemicals complex. It's amazing to think that there used to be three refineries on one site, whereas now in your era there are only six refineries in the entire country. The expertise here was immense. The industrial workforce was immense. 
by the 1950s there was over 30 years heritage of the chemical industry and nearly 100 years of heritage of heavy industry. And so it was very easy to find ready labour and ready expertise to construct a very big new chemicals complex. Let's have a look at what today, in your era, would be classed as an old naphtha cracker. In actual fact, this cracker still exists in your era, but is no longer used, but is an integral part of the UK's ethylene distribution network. If we look at this plant, we can get a bit of a clue about some of the extreme conditions used in the process of naphtha cracking. We see a big chimney, which suggests there must be a lot of heat formed somewhere, and that st steam cracking of naphtha occurs in furnaces. We see long, thin distillation columns just behind that big storage tank, which suggests that a lot of separation has to happen. That storage tank in the foreground is a naphtha storage tank. To the left of the big chimney, we see a vast cooling tower, which suggests that a lot of heat rejection happens on this plant. Heat is always recovered where it is useful, but sometimes the temperature of the heat is just too low to make any use of, and so we need to get rid of it with cooling water. But we need to keep cooling water cool, and so we spray cooling water inside an evaporative cooling tower, and that evaporation process, producing big plumes of steam, cools the water down so we can reuse it to extract heat. Here's another view of this naphtha cracker. In the foreground now you can see two big spheres. These Horton spheres are ethylene storage facilities. They contain gas. These feed into the UK's ethylene network. And again in the background you can see a distillation column and a big chimney and that big cooling tower off to the left. So let's focus in a little bit on the integrated sites of Wilton and of Seal Sands. So, we're going to start our food chain with a refinery, one of the three refineries on the Seal Sands complex. It took in crude oil latterly from the Ecofisk pipeline, but some of its products included naphtha, and methane. The methane was piped over to Billingham to be steam reformed to produce ammonia and the food chain that derives from synthesis gas. The naphtha, however, was piped underneath the River Tees onto the Wilton site into latterly two big naphtha crackers. These naphtha crackers predominantly made ethylene, ethene, but also pyrolysis gasoline. That pyrolysis gasoline it was piped underneath the River Tees to aromatics processing plants. Firstly, benzene was extracted from pyrolysis gasoline by means of distillation. That benzene was then reacted with hydrogen to produce cyclohexane. Separating cyclohexane and benzene by distillation is hugely difficult because their boiling points are to within a fraction of a degree of each other. However, this was done by distillation columns. The distillation column was so big it had to be chopped in two and the two halves put side by side. If it had been constructed as one column it would have been simply too tall to use and would have blown over in the first North Sea gale. The cyclohexane was reacted with ammonia from Billingham, piped in from Billingham, and to produce an intermediate called caprolactam, which is one of the intermediates required to make nylon 6, a polymer. And so nylon was spun into fibres to make materials, stockings, shirts, parachutes, and so on and so forth. Nylon can also be extruded as blocks as a very, very useful engineering material. It was not the only polymer to be produced. If we go back to North Tees and look at the aromatics processing, there are also xylenes present in pyrolysis gasoline. Paraxylene was separated out, piped underneath the river, to make something called pure terephthalic acid. Now, pure terephthalic acid is one of the two components needed to make a very important polymer product. The second of those two components is ethylene glycol, which is made from ethylene via a highly unstable intermediate called ethylene oxide. I used to shudder with fear whenever I used to go near these ethylene oxide plants because the ethylene oxide molecule is so strained it is such, producing such a highly explosive product. However, if you use it as fast as you make it, you try and keep that hazard as low as possible and the product ethylene glycol is very safe compared to an unsafe intermediate ethylene oxide. Ethylene glycol and pure terephthalic acid are reacted together and you make polyethylene terephthalate. You might know it as polyester, or the material you find in soft drinks bottles, 
or the material you'll find in fleece clothing, or a whole range of other clothing items. And so the chemical food chain required to make nylon and polyester, two very, very popular clothing fibres, all stem from crude oil via a vast series of intermediate chemicals, each of which requires its own plant to manufacture. So, a few key points for you. Another big branch of the chemical industry is supported by benzene, toluene and xylene processing. Polymer production, and also I haven't mentioned things like pharmaceutical intermediates, but they're important as well from BTX. Pharmaceutical intermediates and polymer processing relies on this part of the chemical food chain. We saw that benzene can be converted to cyclohexane, into caprolactam, and eventually into nylon. We saw that paraxylene can be converted into pure terephthalic acid, combined with polyethylene glycol, into polyester, or polyethylene terephthalate. And so we've seen yet another example of a highly integrated site. They share common utilities, cooling water, steam. They can share waste heat between plants to improve thermal efficiency. And raw materials piped into one plant are usually intermediates produced by a different plant. And so you have this cascade of chemical processing from refinery through to finished product.